Hello everyone, welcome back to the the updated Beginner's Guide to Hunters, this is Slash. Now I'm going to be using the new format for this because we're going to be talking about a bit more involved topics, such as team composition, things to keep in mind when in most combat situations, things like that. And when I'm here at the loading screen, the first thing that I look at is the team compositions, because at this point with the loading screen, no one can change who they're going to be everyone's locked in and everything and there's a bunch of interesting things to talk about with the, these two team comps now talking about mine first the first thing you should notice is that that is a four magic team comp i am the only source of physical damage on my team now that's very important to me as a hunter because this means two things first off it is going to be my responsibility very definitely to be dealing physical damage in this team composition, there is no fallback physical damage. Because of that, the enemy tanks can very likely lean a little bit more heavily on magic protections rather than physical protections. Because of that fact, the fact that they will want to lean on magic protections, they are going to, if they know what they're doing, prioritize me as a target over the mages. Because if I'm dead, then the rest of the damage they're taking, besides tower shots and minion damage, is going to be magic damage. And between minions and towers and the enemy team, you're obviously going to prioritize the enemy team. So, I know very likely I'm going to be a priority target for those two reasons. Another, another thing that I need to point out is that in this particular instance, Anubis is our uh, quote-unquote warrior. He's actually a third mage, and at this particular point, I don't know whether he's going to build hybrid, if he's going to build any protections at all, for his, or if he's just going to go full mage build. If he goes full mage build, then we only have the one frontliner, namely Cerberus. Which then means that I'm going to have only one person trying to keep me alive rather than the usual two, right? Only one person trying to keep the enemy at bay rather than two. So to that end, I also need to be aware of the fact that enemies may possibly have easier access, but whether or not Anubis builds hybrid, it's very likely our early game initiation is going to suffer because it's pretty unlikely that he'll build Blink for initiation, and Anubis of course has no natural initiation, so it could be a bit difficult for us to turn around and aggress on the enemy team in any given situation. So these are the things that I'm looking at. Finally, the last thing I want to mention is, for Slash specifically, is a Wheelish. Now, a Wheelish is an assassin, and in Slash, assassins build all kinds of ways. I've seen full tank assassins, I've seen hybrid assassins that build some power and some protections, and I've seen full power assassins in Slash. I don't know what a wheelish is going to build, so I'm going to want to adjust my build accordingly, or build in such a way that I can just very easily either incorporate more penetration, or not incorporate penetration as I need. Now, my knee-jerk reaction is a very unique Neath crit build that I've come up with, but this isn't necessarily normally how I would build most hunters. I will talk about what deviations I'm making because I am Neath over, say, Artemis or Hachiman, more standard hunters that rely a bit more heavily on their auto-attacks for their damage output. So these are the things that I'm thinking about right here and now. Now, the whole loading screen took about half a minute, so these are all things that I'm reflecting on in that half-minute time span. And then we just kind of pop into the match pretty shortly afterwards. Now, the first thing I'm going to do, I said I was going to go for a crit build. With Neath, very specifically, I'm going to wind up going with Soul Eater. For most other hunters, I would actually pick Devourer's Gauntlet. And you, you saw me hesitate there. I was trying to decide if Beads or Aegis was going to be the better choice here, but ultimately, because of Wheelish's ult being able to pull me out of my backflip as Neath, I choose Beads here. Now, I pick the Sentry Ward because at this point in the game, I don't know how aggressive the enemy team composition is going to be, and I want to know where they are. As the only physical damage source, I know I'm a priority target, so knowledge is going to be my primary method of survival, especially if Anubis decides not to build protections. The wards are going to be my sort of way of surviving. Now, an interesting thing happens here, and this doesn't usually happen in Slash, but a Wheelish engages on Anubis. Now, this is a fairly bold choice, and she probably made this decision because she saw our team comp and likely figured to herself, well, there's three mages, there's one hunter, and there's one guardian, so if the Anubis does build protections later on in the game, he's going to be more difficult to kill, so I need to try and kill him early, make sure he falls behind. This doesn't work out in her favor, but this is very likely what she was thinking at the time. I was not too surprised. It is somewhat surprising, it is unusual to see that in Slash, 
Um, but, you know, I, I go in, now, I actually go in, pardon me, I just punched my mic. I go in here, hold on, let's go back 20 seconds. I actually follow up with this for two reasons. One, I want to discourage the Willish from continuing the attack. Second, I want to throw in some pokes so that way when we go for the damage buff, we have a bit more HP than the enemy does available to us, right? So that way we have a better time, or at least a slightly safer time taking this damage buff. Now we go on ahead and fight over this. Poseidon puts down his whirlpool to try to take it. Now they actually get this, and a very interesting thing happens where Wheelish gets it, then she goes for this, she almost dies, and then this interesting thing happens, the Cerberus jumps in to finish her off. Now this is interesting from a Hunter's perspective, because I know that that wasn't initiation, that was him confirming a kill that no one else is going to confirm. This wasn't deliberate initiation on his part. Now he's got no escape plan, so now, myself and the rest of the team need to decide, what are we going to do about this? We got first blood, so it's not necessarily a bad idea to just walk away, cut our losses, let him die, and get the mild benefit of first blood there. But, I say mild benefit, we would only get the benefit in experience, because as you can see up here, despite that first blood, we don't have the gold advantage, because of the fact that they grabbed the buff. You can actually see where the gold advantage only shifts right afterwards. Our gold advantage is very mild, right? We only have uh, 600. Five, actually, it would be more accurate to say 500 more gold. That's fine. But we're not so far ahead. But we are a little bit ahead to the point where we could cut the losses. And because they got the buff, it would probably tie us up. Now, I am looking as a hunter. I'm going over to the right lane because I want to go over here anyways, and I'm seeing, if you notice on the mini-map, that Hera and Thoth are going in. Anubis is kind of thinking about it, so I'm just going to go in. At this point, I'm not trying to get any kills. I'm trying to get some poke. I'm trying to discourage them from continuing to pursue the Cerberus. Now, as a hunter... Actually, I can let this run. As a hunter, your primary method of discouraging people from doing something is by hitting them. Okay, for supports, a lot of the time it's going to be crowd control, for instance, but for hunters, a lot of that time it's going to be just plain old damage. Now we go on ahead and we're just clearing the wave. Everyone shifts to the left lane except for myself. I stay in right lane to keep it defended. Theoretically, I shouldn't be alone. I should have someone else with me. I don't. I think about going for the speed buff, but I see that the wave is coming up pretty soon, and I don't want to abandon that with two enemies in lane, so I go on ahead and I clear this. Cerberus is kicking around because he doesn't want me alone. This is a good decision on his part, by the way. And what I can't figure out is why he initiates here. This is a 2v3. Not a great idea. Yes, we have the advantage because of the first blood, but it's, we don't have enough of a lead where a 2v3 is going to work out. He gets to get out fairly free, which is really good because I didn't have the mana to get him out. I'm going to back at this point for mana. Right, I need mana. I want to grab my stage 2 of the gauntlet. That's great. Here we go. So I'm going to go on ahead, and I go left first because it's a 2v3, and the two squishier mages are on this side. Anubis, by default, because of his passive, is a little tankier. I'm less concerned about him, so I come to the left lane. They clear the problem. The enemy wasn't really serious about attacking them. They were probably just looking for poke. But I wasn't sure myself, so I went over to the left lane, so I come back over to the right. And here we are, and I'm just looking to clear waves with Anubis at this point. I'm not looking for anything serious. And then the Anubis, he's going to try to position forward to use his Locust Breath, and then he gets ulted by Poseidon. Now this becomes an interesting decision for me, because what I do in response is the classic Hunter thing. I'm looking to save Anubis, so, naturally... My move here is to try to inflict enough damage on the enemy to discourage the pursuit. So I'm going to go in on this. Now, I go in on this because you can see right here that Poseidon has very little mana. And on this assumption that he's not got the mana to launch a heavy amount of attacks, I played this fairly aggressively. This turns out to be a mistake on my part. I'll explain in a bit when I bring up the, uh, the scoreboard a bit later on after this little conflict, but I do the poke, and Anubis gets out. I'm looking to just finish the wave off, and they initiate on me. Now I'm confused. This startles me. Poseidon has very low mana. I don't know why he would initiate on me. It's not too unusual for a hunter to initiate, but the Poseidon very clearly moved forward through the whirlpool down in an effort to try to crowd control me and then try to do some damage past that. I'm confused. He hasn't got the mana for this, so I don't know what's going on. I wasn't expecting this, and I almost die for it. Now, again, I'm, I'm going to throw out an ult here to try to confirm a kill. Nothing happens. I see Sun Wukong coming in. I'm going to stun him. It turns out to be the fake one. Shame on me. 
I go back at this point because there's nothing else I can contribute without dying. Now, what I do here is I wait for Soul Eater because I don't want to leave Fountain without having my stacking item, obviously. I wait a couple of seconds for this, and then right afterwards, I check the items because I'm confused about why Poseidon initiated on me. Right, and this is going to come up right here, and you can see right here that the Poseidon is building attack speed. He's going for an auto-attack Poseidon build, and this is why he initiated. As low as his mana was, he sees his primary damage source as those auto-attacks, and even though at this particular point he's only got two items and isn't hitting that hard, that item still increases his attack speed a little bit. So he's more likely to kill me from a, a uh, position of low mana than he would be otherwise, because his primary damage output is going to be an auto-attacks, and he has, of course, death, death toll, so he gets mana back as he hits auto-attacks. So this is what his line of thought was, and I had assumed he was going ability-based, which is what most Poseidons do, but he went auto attacks so that is why i was so very surprised at that point and that's why i almost died if he had been building towards abilities i probably would not have had quite as close a call i probably still would have had one if he had decided to initiate on that but i don't think it would have been quite as close because once i got out of the whirlpool a lot of his damage would have been gone because his auto attacks obviously aren't hitting hard now at this point i'm just looking for poke again missed my route that's fine i'm not really that broken up about it it's just all about that poke right now just that way, whenever we have the next team fight, we have the advantage of not having to deal with both of these at the same time. They back, and then a Wheelish is back here. Now, I wasn't initially aware of a Wheelish being back here. I just turn and start attacking her. Here's some Kong, get some poke on him. I'm not expecting to do, you know, get any kills here. I'm still just looking for poke. I'm looking at their waves. I'm not looking for anything really serious. I'm not looking to commit. Right. We've got most of the team over here because the, most of the enemy team is over there. Try to stop her from backing. Just to delay her a little bit doesn't work. That's fine. I'm not going to commit mana to a delay in backing. Now everyone's going over to the left lane. I'm initiating on the wheelish. Now what I was expecting at this particular point was for Cerberus to actually jump over the wall and continue pressing that. He doesn't. I back off because I no longer like that fight. They still are farting around over there looking for something. Now, you can see where, and I'm, I, this is only my theory because I wasn't there to see it, I believe Sun Wukong initiated and Cerberus dove in on him because as you'll see in a bit, Sun Wukong did not have any mana at this point. You can actually see right here, Sun Wukong is out of mana. I think Sun Wukong initiated, ran out of mana, and Cerberus counter-initiated on the strength of that, but what we're fighting for right now is this Juggernaut, okay? That is what we are looking for. So I'm looking to take out the enemy damage primarily. So that's why I'm going for Poseidon here. So I'm going to target Poseidon. We're going to take care of him. And then I'm looking to take out more damage. That's why I'm looking at the Wheelish very specifically. She kills the Cerberus here. Uh, no, I'm sorry. She doesn't kill the Cerberus here. She backs. She gets him low enough where he backs. Excuse me. Uh, so what I do is I abandon the idea of the Juggernaut. Why is this? Very simply... Cerberus is no longer going to be present to defend us and the Juggernaut. If you try to initiate a fight onto a Juggernaut in Slash and your front line isn't fully present, you stand a very high risk of having that stolen from you. And given the situation, Poseidon's about to come up in three seconds, the Maui and the Ishtar could very easily stall us out under the Juggernaut for the enemy team to come back. Yes, Cerberus would come back, but our next team fight wouldn't necessarily be much better. So what Hera and I... And I believe Thoth is actually thinking about as well because he follows us. What we're all thinking of is trying to just capitalize on this momentum. We want to get another kill to try to put us into a better position for the next team fight to maybe take that juggernaut afterwards. So I'm, again, looking for that kill. I'm looking to stun Ishtar. I'm looking to do some damage. And, you know, credit to Thoth here. He absolutely picks up what I'm laying down here. Barely gets out alive. Now, I have to get pulled in by this ult because I have no idea it can reach that far. Just to take a quick pause. I've only played, before this match, I'd only played five matches with Maui, with and against. I had no idea he could fire that off from that distance. Obviously, I've, I've seen what it does, and I know what it can do. I just didn't know it had that kind of range, because I've never seen it used from that range. So that was very much surprising, so I kind of just, I'm just trying to get out of there now at this point, alive. A wheelish ults me, I beads, you know, glorious beads. And then I'm just trying to get out, because I don't have mana. Her was there to clear the wave in theory. I'm not worried about it. I go back and I'm looking to build my next item, which of course at this particular point is going to be Hydra's Lament. And then I'm going to head left. Now I am heading left because no one's there. I don't want an enemy to show up in that lane, clear the wave, and then push down that tower. But there's enough going on in mid that I think about going there. Now I'm clearing these really quick because obviously I need golden experience. I want the mana. 
but I'm still, you know, primarily looking to go left lane at this point, and I'm kind of keeping an eye on what Cerberus is doing, because obviously Cerberus is our initiation, so I'm coming over here, and I'm going to clear this wave. Right, I'm just going to go on ahead and wipe this out, get the golden experience, make sure that our wave is pushing up, and then I'm going to head to the right lane. Okay. Now, originally I'm going to head to the right lane because I can see a problem developing there. I can see a team fight beginning to kind of roil there. Thoth calls me back to the Juggernaut. I don't like this for two reasons. One, our front line isn't here, Anubis and Cerberus. Two, I don't know where all of the enemy are. Three, as you can see, Cerberus just died. So, Cerberus did die. We did get the Juggernaut, so he didn't die for nothing. But we, I mean, Cerberus did die. He probably could have really used our help over there. I'm not really fond of that call, but I know if I didn't listen to it, it was very likely he was just going to continue on with it anyways. Now, I wasn't intending to kill Sun Wukong until he almost died and I got the root. Still can't kill him, though. I just back off. Thoth is gone. Now, I see pinging. See, I turn around like that because I see pinging from Hera, and I'm not sure what she's talking about. Turns out that it's actually a wheelish. And I only realized that when Cerber starts running back towards me, and I'm like, wait a minute, there's no wheelish back here. So we initiate, because obviously she's out of position. She's out of position, Cerberus pursue her, pursues her. This is exactly the correct decision by Cerberus, right? I can see also Poseidon's getting attacked here by Thoth, and we're just going to go on ahead and go for a fight. At this point, we're fighting for the tower, right? We have the Juggernaut under tower. We're looking to grab the tower. That is our goal, and I know this as a hunter. So I try to kill Poseidon, and I fail because I didn't charge it for long enough. That's on me. I go for the tower at this point, and we take the tower. That's not really a big deal. We also have Argus, so I aggress because Argus is there, and we've got all this damage. I'm looking to maybe get some kills or get someone killed. Argus picks that up. That's great. That's kind of what I was looking for. And then everyone backs off, and I'm not immediately aware of this. I'm shooting Maui, and it's at this point that I become aware of the fact that everyone but Cerberus is gone. And I press forward a little bit here because Cerberus is obviously right behind me with a low health Sun Wukong. We've got the low health Maui, and then we have Poseidon coming in. Nice and spicy hot. So, at this point, I have to make a decision. And I you can see me making it a little bit before this. So, I back to becoming aware of the fact that my allies are leaving. I go back and trying to, you know, I'm clearing the wave. Here's Poseidon. I'm now backing up. And then I see this going on over here. Argus and Cerberus fighting Sun Wukong. And I'm now going to have to make a decision. Do I initiate on this with Cerberus? Do I keep going with this? Or do I back off? and see if Cerberus backs off. I see Hera here, so I'm assuming she's going to participate, so it's a 3v3. I decide to go on ahead and attack. Now, I make that decision because we're ahead at this point in time, right? In a 3v3 scenario with two of the enemy almost dead, we have the advantage, right? Besides the only one fresh from the fight, although I'm pretty fresh as well, but we have the level and experience, I'm sorry, that we have the level and gold advantage. So, you know, we kind of dedicate, I pick up that kill from Hera, and then we just kind of back off, now we back off very specifically because at this particular point in time, we just killed Maui. We know where Sun Wukong and Poseidon are, but we don't know where Wheelish is and where Ishtar is. Now the problem is specifically Wheelish in this case. She moves very quickly when she's riding on Sugu. She's very fast. The last thing we need right now is for her to fly in from the jungle, slap down Cerberus, and then start picking off Hera and I one, on, one by one. So we pull back at this point, mostly because we don't know where uh, a wheelish is very specifically. I know if I were the Cerberus, that would be my chief concern. And in fact, you can see her really quick there in lane, and they go off to do, I believe, their blue buff. So I'm going to initially go back, but I see that the waves are about to meet. So I go on ahead and clear that. Here's Ishtar. Now, I don't initiate on Ishtar for the same reason. I don't know where the enemy is. I just back. That's not worth the trouble. I'm ahead. I want to stay ahead. I don't want to die in a bad trade. So I finish Hydra's Lament, and I increase my beads because obviously that's going to be important. I grab my Aegis for the same reason. I, you know, obviously missed it the first time. I see a fight going on in mid. I'm going to be on my way, right? I don't know what's going on. Now, I'm using my ult here for a very specific reason, really quick. I'm using this because I'm not going to get there in time to necessarily make a major contribution. I don't want Cerberus dying before I get there, so I'm trying to just stun one of the damage dealers off the top, you know, just from a distance. I also want to point out the fact that for the first time since level 5, I've increased, I've leveled my ult. When you're playing Neath, Spirit Arrow is your clear, and it's the first thing you should be leveling. The second ability, Unravel, is your self-heal, should be the second ability you're increasing. Once those two are maxed, then you put as many points as you can into your ult, and then you just flip back and forth between backflip and your ult. This is again a Neath thing, not necessarily a Hunter thing. 
So the fight breaks up kind of. I clear this with Anubis. I'm initiating on Sun Wukong here because I see that the entire rest of the enemy team is busy fighting in right lane. So I'm hoping that if I can kill Sun Wukong, I can move over to right lane scot-free. I fail at this, so I just move over anyways because not moving over would just be asking for my team to carry a potentially future 5v4 if Sun Wukong heals and comes back to the fight quick enough. So we're just going to fight here. I'm looking for poke primarily at this point. I I'm kind of assuming that we won't get any kills here. Um, and then it becomes a fight for the tower because we just push that far. Mostly Anubis pushes that far. And again, he's kind of filling the warrior position, so I just follow his lead. We grab the tower. Argus goes down, so I keep pursuing because obviously Argus can tank whatever I need him to tank. Then he leaves, but I'm really trying to get this Maui. It doesn't happen. I'm trying to back out at this point. Surprise, Sun Wukong. Mildly concerning, but at this particular point in time... It's not really that big of a deal. Now, I'm backing at this point. We could pursue this, in theory, right? But at this particular point in time, a lot of us are in very poor health and we're all squishy. In fact, the only one who is above half health is Cerberus, right? And that's not terribly safe because the only one on half health on their team, because he's the only one who didn't literally just respawn, is Sun Wukong. So it's a bad fight. We are ahead, but it's not a great fight, so I back up, you can see Anubis backing up, the whole team is trying to back out of that at this point, right? Could we have done something with that? Maybe. Possibly. Would it have been risky to do so? Yes, and if we lost that gamble, we the enemy team would be catching up, right? Now, Cerberus is continuing to fight. I don't know if he just got counter-initiated on, I'm gonna go, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about going over there and helping him out, and then I see that they drop the red buff, and I'm... At this point, I make a mistake. This is this is my first serious mistake. You know, the whole thing with Poseidon using auto attacks instead of abilities, fairly innocent mistake. It didn't kill me. This, this is a mistake I make. This is a rather serious mistake. I'm going to initiate in a 3v1 scenario. Now, I do this because I'm cocky, right? We're, we're ahead. I'm fresh. Cerberus is right there, right? Now, the mistake that I'm making here is, not only is it a 3v1 initially, but even when Cerberus joins, it becomes a 3v2, and Ishtar is closer than Anubis is, so it can very easily devolve into a 4v2 before Anubis can get there to make it a 4v3. But even when Anubis gets there, we're still at a numerical disadvantage, so this is a huge mistake I'm about to make right here. But I initiate on the Poseidon. Major mistake, I should not have made this choice. Cerberus, bless his soul, follows my lead, even though he really shouldn't be, because I'm a hunter and not, I shouldn't be making these decisions. Now, yes, I do, in fact, pick up Poseidon here, and then I am gonna try to run away, I'm trying to stall for time, trying to get my backflip, I am about to backflip away, and I die. Was I worth Poseidon? No. Was Cerberus worth Poseidon? Maybe individually, but the two of us put together, Terrible trade, terrible trade. Now, what turns out to be good is the enemy team, on the strength of this win, keeps pushing. And this is their mistake. They're still behind. Despite the fact that they just killed Cerberus and I, they are still behind. So, despite this mildly inconvenient fact for them, they push. And as a result, two of them die. For no damn reason. They didn't even get the tower. So, what Cerberus and I do here, and I, I could have done this by myself, to be completely honest, I just needed the Juggernaut. I didn't technically need Cerberus here, but I appreciate him being here because he made it a, a sure thing rather than a probable thing, but while the rest of the team is distracting the enemy in left lane, Cerberus is keeping Poseidon off of me so I can take the tower pretty, uh, pretty clean. Right here, I just go on ahead and shoot this down. Now, I advance because I've got Cerberus and Juggernaut versus, you know, those two. We have an experience advantage and, theoretically, a numbers advantage. Here's Thoth. Now it's a 3v2. Cerberus is trying to back out, and then we get jumped by Maui, of all people. And now it's a 3v3. We still have the Juggernaut, so I'm still willing to attack at this point because we still have, you know, at that point we still had numerical advantage. The Juggernaut dies, now it's a 3v3. Still okay with this because here's our allies. You can see them coming up behind. I'm still willing to attack at this point or at the very least do some damage because at this particular juncture, we are, you know, our team is here and then suddenly the team backs off. And I think it's because Sun Wukong is kicking around there. And they got surprised by him, so they all collectively back off. At this point, my priority is switched to trying to save Anubis, right? So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to deter the enemy. I might have missed that route, but it still scared Sun Wukong, so mission accomplished. Now, I make a very interesting... Uh, something very interesting happens. Cerberus goes in, obviously, to help save the Anubis. 
and Sun Wukong dives for the Anubis. Now, this is going... I'm going to be coming back to this point later on in the match. You'll see what I mean. But the Sun Wukong dives for the Anubis because the Anubis is at the lower health. Now, I have to make a choice. As a hunter, and you'll see me... Actually, right before I dedicate to this, you'll see me in a bit. Uh, hold on. I actually pass it by. So, at this particular point, Cerberus blinks in. He's initiating to help save Anubis. And then I... I, right at this point, I'm thinking about going on Sun Wukong because it's fairly obvious that Sun Wukong is going to go on to Anubis. I decide not to help Anubis for two reasons. One, my allies are primarily better positioned to save Anubis should he need it. Two, Anubis has a large amount of lifesteal. A Sun Wukong versus Anubis fight should not usually result in Anubis' death if they're approximately the same level. Anubis has enough lifesteal, or he should have enough lifesteal at this point. We're 11 minutes into the game for Pete's sakes. He should have enough life steal to be able to outlast the Sun Wukong with not too much trouble. With that being said, Cerberus has just dove in, he's used his ult, and he's used his blink. He's in a higher risk position, so if I don't help him, it's very likely he's going to die. So I abandon the Anubis to the Sun Wukong because that shouldn't be a problem for him, and I'm trying to help out the Cerberus here. Okay, the enemy team backs off. In general, you know, they're they're all fighting around. We're, I'm just clearing minions at this point. Maybe I'm, you know, going to try to get some poke or anything. I'm not looking for anything serious. Here's Sun Wukong blasting me. Now, this is what surprises me a lot. When Sun Wukong pops me up, the Wheelish pulls me in from here. Now, this is a fairly odd decision because this puts her very separate from the rest of her team. And I'm two levels higher at this point. So, I'm not really sure what she was thinking here. Now, I go on ahead and I aggress. I'm not concerned. I run to the tower because, as a hunter, if you're not fighting under under tower when you can, what's wrong with you? If you can be under tower and shoot people, be under tower and shoot people. What surprises me here, and this really catches me off guard, you can see me panic mildly here, is Sun Wukong initiates on me. He, he follows me under tower. Now, he's looking to kill me, which isn't necessarily itself a bad decision at first. Now, I'm... You'll notice I just used my ult there to try to stun him. At this point, I've given up on trying to live. I know I'm going to die, right? I'm trying to make it so that way Hera takes Sun Wukong with me. Okay, make it a one, a, a two for one. A wheelish and Sun Wukong for me. That's what I'm trying to do. He beads out of it, right? He used beads, and then he just leaves. He could have killed me, and quite frankly, I'm worth more than he is at this particular point in time, so he probably should have just dedicated himself to it, but he does not. So he just goes back with, at no cost. And uh, there's another disadvantage to this. He goes back and basically pays the time penalty of having to go back and then re-enter the fight. I have a juggernaut that I can just teleport to. I'm there, back in the fight, almost immediately. I still have to travel a little bit of distance, but it's not as much distance as Sun Wukong does. And in the meantime, Poseidon's died. In the meantime, we're in a really strong position to kill a couple more of them. I pick up the Ishtar, primarily accidentally... You know, Hera gets the Maui, and we're pushing down this Juggernaut into the right Phoenix. We're pretty likely to get the Phoenix at this point, okay? So that's Sun Wukong's mistake there, and it's not necessarily an unnatural mistake. It does make sense. He got scared. He was taking a lot of damage. He needed to get out. It's it's a natural human response, but it did... It, it, it gave me the advantage, basically, in terms of time alone. In, in no other ways. So, you know, we're just parting around the Phoenix. We're trying to do some poke. We're trying to get some damage in on them while we're doing that. We take the Phoenix. We're going to move to the Juggernaut because we can. They're trying to deal with the old Juggernaut. We need a new one. Here it is. Boom, Juggernaut left lane exactly where we needed it to be. Go ahead and wipe out the rest of the jungle for the golden experience at this point. It's a lovely time. And now we're just off to go do... Mainly clear the wave here. Because I don't need to go back at this point. I have full health and mana, so I don't want to go back. Uh, we go on ahead and try and get some poke here. The enemy team is a bit more serious about this. They actually initiate, which, you know, gets them a couple of kills. Now, it's looking pretty grim right now, but I'm still pretty confident in the fight because we're still ahead. Yes, we just lost someone. We have a Juggernaut. We just lost Anubis. I've got Sun Wukong separated and cut off from his team, though, so this is a really great time for me, even if I can't hit a damn shot. But this really puts me in a great position. I'm trying to kill Anubis. I'm, I'm sorry, not Anubis. Sun Wukong. I ult him to finish him off. And now it's a 3v4. Poseidon's almost dead, so I know if I can kill Poseidon, we can really recover this team fight. I kill him. I now know we're in a pretty good position. Now I'm going to go after Maui. 
Now, I register the fact that Wheelish kills Cerberus. It does not occur to me that she's going to go on to me next. So I'm now in danger. They've turned it around because Hera backed. Both is backing. I'm in danger. I'm going to run to the speed camp very specifically so that way I can try to scare them off using potentially damage from the speed camp. That's the idea here. It doesn't work. Maui just grabs me. Okay, I beads out. I Aegis. I Aegis badly, by the way. And then I'm just trying to get out at this point. And Ser uh, Hera saves me. Right, it's a combination of me moving forward, which clearly Wheelish wasn't expecting, and the Argus landing on Maui, preventing him from doing anything. These save me. Hera absolutely does a fantastic job cleaning these two up. I don't know why the Wheelish was so dedicated to that, but once the Wheelish dies, I'm just like, I can, I have a full stacked Soul Eater. I can just heal off these camps, and I do. Watch how much I heal off of this camp, off of a couple of other things. Right, I'm just going to heal off of this and leave. And then, you know, my team is on Apophis because at this particular point we have a numbers advantage, so it's a decent idea. They're missing Maui, their primary front line. They've only got some Kong, who, by the way, does make an effort. Credit to him. We take Apophis. Sun Wukong is ulting out. I try to kill Poseidon. He Aegises. Cerberus picks it up. It's fine. You can actually see the tail end of that Aegis. Now, at this point, I'm just clearing the Juggernaut because my team isn't going to need help in a 4v3 we're ahead and it's a 4v3, my team shouldn't need help here, right? So I'm going to go on ahead and solo clear the Juggernaut. Again, I'm a hunter. It's, you know, one of my responsibilities is to clear the Juggernaut if no one else is available. And I'm not worried at this point. I know a Wheelish has come back, but I'm assuming, and I, it, tur it turns out I assume incorrectly, I am assuming a Wheelish is going to help her team in right lane, right? That is my assumption. It's a fairly logical assumption because that's what most people do. Oh, my team is in trouble. Let me go help them. It's a natural instinct. So I start backing here. I lazy back. Here's Wheelish. You can see me panic right here because I absolutely miss everything. I completely panicked at first. And she kills me as a result of that because if I just landed that spirit arrow, I probably would have lived. But I panic and I die. And, you know, fair fair play to Wheelish. It was a really good strategic decision. Take me out. Now, the, now my team has less damage. I'm dead for half a second. They're all back up. And even though we have a Juggernaut, it's, it's going to be a fairly iffy prospect for my team to try to engage without me in general because now it's a 5v4 and they've lost we've lost our only physical damage now i'm not you know being like oh i'm the hunter i'm so important i'm unusually important in this case as i stated before because i am the only source of physical damage okay so in this particular instance purely by merit of our terrible team composition i am that important normally i am not so important that this potentially cripples the team but because i'm dead that's a totally different story because I'm the only physical damage output on the team, okay? This is not an ego trip thing. This is just me being our only physical power, and I'm dead. So now if the enemy support and the enemy frontline in general actually has been building properly, then they're not going to really be taking a lot of damage from the magics if they've been building properly. So Hera and Thoth, they do the right thing. They're pushing down left lane. It's a 2v2 in right lane that obviously we can, you know, my team can handle. And it turns out actually it was, uh, it, 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 it keeps switching between two, uh, 2v2 and a 2v3. It's throughout that fight before they kill Poseidon, then it's 2v2. I'm going down with the Juggernaut so I can help press this Phoenix. Now he comes in to interfere. I'm just looking for Pope at this point. The Juggernaut's obviously almost dead. We take Maui. I'm trying to get Argus a kill here doesn't work, but those does pick up Ishtar. It's fine. You can see Anubis and Cerberus pressing the Titan at this particular point in time, and we're taking the Phoenix. You know, we're going to be pushing in because we have Argus here, and we're just going to try to take the, uh, the Titan, but that doesn't really work out initially at least. We're, now I'm keeping on pressing because at this point, I'm not going to be able to get away from a wheelish at the very least, so I'm looking to kill her. I kill her. We've still got Argus. We've got uh, Sun Wukong here. I can see my allies clearing the Juggernaut, but I don't want to stick around. Because we now have a new Juggernaut, I can theoretically safely leave and be able to teleport to the Juggernaut. Now, I know Sun Wukong is chasing me at this point, but I don't think he's going to chase me this far. Now, the reason why I don't think he's going to chase me too far is because at this particular point, they've lost a Phoenix, and they almost have lost their second Phoenix, and they've got two Juggernauts coming in. From his strategic perspective, he really should be backing. He should be shoring up his defenses. He should be prepping to hold off the Juggernauts. 
What he does instead, which gives me my second heart attack of the game, is he blinks and he hits me with his stick. Which kills me. That's fine. But, this puts him in a really ugly position. You can see it on the minimap here where Hera cuts him off. And he's in this really terrible position. He's half dead. And I have no idea what was distracting me or why I didn't turn the camera to spectate this. So I apologize for that. But something was clearly distracting me. But they section off the Sun Wukong and they absolutely butcher this fool. Right? He was, he hunted down the kill, and this is a prime example of why it's such a terrible idea for frontliners to hunt down the kill like that. Because that's a really extreme example. Yes, he killed me. Yes, I'm worth more than him. Both of these are true. But, with two juggernauts barreling down left lane, and they're already missing the phoenix in that lane, this gives, a, gives us, my team, a huge opportunity. I am almost guaranteed to be able to teleport to a Juggernaut when I respawn in 15 seconds. Sun Wukong is down for 40. This is a huge problem for their team because he is one of the really main... Uh, he is one of their only two frontliners. He is one of the main things theoretically holding their team together at this point. So it was a huge strategic... Um, mistake on his part to kill me. I don't mind dying here. Look at the opportunity it's given us. They pick up Poseidon because there's no one there to save Poseidon. They pick up a Wheelish because there's no one there to save a Wheelish other than Maui and obviously as a single front line he can't do that much. And we just we just come in here and we, we clean up the Titan. We just absolutely decimate this thing. But just as Sun Wukong is respawning actually if you notice that Sun Wukong respawns just at that particular specific moment. Now I something happened in my recording here where my recording cut out before the end game. So we're going to have to use back when I was looking at the enemy composition. I think it was right before this, where I was looking at the builds here. So let's talk about builds for a little bit. Now, we should not have won this with our team composition. We're four magics, we have three mages, and our Anubis wasn't even building hybrid. He was building full mage. Right? We shouldn't technically have won this. But the reason why we did is because the enemy frontline actually really botched their builds, as well as the Poseidon. Now... Auto Attack Poseidon, I'm going to talk about this first. Auto Attack Poseidon is good. Do not misunderstand me here. Auto Attack Poseidon is a very powerful force of evil. However, the problem here is that his team did not need another Auto Attacker. They had Ishtar. They had a Wheelish who clearly was building Auto attack -y. Right, this is actually why I started building the bow here. I was going to build a Kyvel because I was reflecting on the fact that, hey... They have a lot of auto attackers. A wheelish is building auto attack. She's got gilded arrow. She's got shadow steel shuriken, deathbringer, stone cutting sword. These are all auto attack items. She's looking to focus her damage in on auto attacks. Poseidon's using auto attacks. Ishtar is using auto attacks. Ekival is an incredibly powerful item against auto attack heavy compositions. And while I wasn't expecting to use this at first, and this is frankly why I'm checking the scoreboard now. This is a huge opportunity for Kyvel. Now, I don't really get to use a Kyvel much because the you know enemy loses before then, but that's what I was going to build as my final item. Uh, by the way, fun fact with the crits, really quickly while I'm talking about my build, uh, when you evolve Gilded Arrow into the Ornate Arrow, right, that has a 5% default uh, physical strike chance increase, and then its passive is when you're at 2,000... For every... Uh, for every 100 gold up to 2,000, you get 1% increased critical strike chance. Up to 2,000 gold is 20%. So when you have 2,000 plus gold, the Ornate Arrow gives you 25% crit chance. Rage gives you a 45% crit chance. 25 plus 45, that turns out to be 70. Plus the 30% from Deathbringer means that you have a 100% critical strike chance. Guaranteed critical hits the whole way through. Now, the reason why I have that specific cliff on the Deathbringer, it's not the, it's not the Envenomed Deathbringer, it's the other one that I... The Malicious Deathbringer? I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. But that one gives you one second off your ability cooldowns for every crit you get. If you just heard the words, your cooldown... All your non-ult cooldowns decrease by one second for every auto attack you fire because they're all guaranteed crits, you just did. Yes. Three items give you, with just three crit items, gives you 100% crit chance, and with the malicious Deathbringer or whatever it's called, that means that every auto attack is a guaranteed crit, 
and every auto attack decreases your ability cooldowns, except your ult. Yes, it's dis it's as disgusting as it sounds, and you maybe you'll see this in more detail in Conquest, but this build works pretty similarly for most hunters, although for most hunters I use the Envenomed Deathbringer instead. Um, also, I'll typically swap out... Um, Rage for Atlantis Bow, which does give you 25% less crits, so you're down to 75% crit chance, but you get more lifesteal on that. So it's a trade I'm willing to make a lot of the time for more auto-attacky uh, hunters, but it's it's down to your preference. But yes, you can get guaranteed crits in three items, and you can reduce the cooldowns of your abilities for every auto-attack using that method, just as a fun fact. Anyways, back to the point here, the reason why the enemy team lost is because the Maui and the Sun Wukong built wrong. Now, Sun Wukong building Warrior's Axe, Soul Eater, Only Hunter's Garb, this is all fine. I can even be fine with the Manticore Spike. Gladiator Shield, I kind of understand, a little iffy on this. And then he decides to double down on damage and builds, I'm assuming this is going to be the Crusher, it, could just as easily be Brawler's Beat Stick. It doesn't really make a difference. The point is that this is damage. Right? And he he really needed more magic protections against our team composition. So this is really his big mistake. I'll, also, if he wanted you know some damage, he should have built magic protections as his fifth item. And then used Glad Shield as his last. Okay, this was a bit of an oversight on the Sun Wukong's part. That's fine. It's the Maui that really confuses me. Sentinel's Gift. Fine. Mail of Renewal. Now, Mail of Renewal is overrated in my opinion, okay? Just as a matter of, of course. The reason I say that is because it only heals you once every minute. And yes, it's stacking up your protections a little bit. I believe it comes out to like 24, I want to say, 25-ish. Which is okay, but that doesn't last forever. That's a that is a timed bonus in protections. At that particular point, why not just build um, Mantle of Discord and get a passive that's going to save your ass whenever you're under a certain amount of health, rather than this inconsistent heal that might heal you when you don't even need it. Because sometimes that's just how it works with Mail of Renewal. I don't like. <coughs> Sorry, me. Pardon me. Uh, pardon me. I apologize. I was so choked up that I actually choked on saliva. Anyways, back to the main point here. The issue with Mail of Renewal is that it's too slow. The heal on this is too slow. It's too infrequent. It doesn't do what it needs to do, in my opinion, in time. Uh, then he builds Mandacore's Spike. Again, for some unholy reason, we are a four magic composition. He should have opened with Heart Ward. He should have gone right into some other form of magic protection, such as the Pestilence he builds very last. I mean, consider... Anubis self-heals, Cerberus self-heals, I self-heal. His third item should have been, you know, Pestilence. Sun Wukong wasn't building it, but Sun Wukong is a warrior. He should be building hybrid. That's fine. Maui is a guardian. He is their support. He should have been building much more protections. This this Mail of Renewal should have been Heartward. This Manticore Spike should have been um, Pestilence. This random Ritual Dagger should have been some form of you know, physical protection, or possibly Pridwin for the cooldowns, either Breastplate of Valor or Pridwin just for the cooldowns. Pridwin would have been the better choice, actually. Uh, then we've got the good old glorious, you know, next item, which should have, by all means, been something that healed him more consistently than Mailed of Renewal, such as possibly Stone of Gaia. And then maybe he would have finished up with splashing a bit of damage in, perhaps... Uh, he waits until literally one, two, three, four, five items to build solo magic protections. Fifth item is pure magic protections. What in tarnation is this, right? This makes no damn sense to me. This is a terrible build for what our composition is. And this is a big reason why they lost. If they just built more magic protections, Sun Wukong is very nearly as guilty of this as Maui is. They should have built much more magic protections. And now I wouldn't normally address this in a hunter video, but it's just it, it really goes to give you the impact of how much of a difference it can make for you as a hunter. I you you can see where I had twenty percent uh, penetration, and at this point when I was trying to figure out if I wanted a kaival, the other option was silver branch. 
okay, just for the, the cooldowns. I'm sorry, not the cooldowns, the penetration. I was trying to figure out, does the enemy team have enough physical protections to justify me building Silver Branch or maybe I won Executioner or something like that? The short answer was no. Sun Wukong has... I think this totals out to 80 additional physical protections. This totals out to uh, 70 plus a spontaneous extra 25. They're really not building enough physical protections. Well, there's also Sentinel's Gift on Maui, but that's beside the point. They're not really building enough physical protections, which frankly didn't surprise me too much, but what did surprise me was Maui's dual protection items in situations where he should have been building full magic protections. It just didn't make sense to me then. It still doesn't make sense to me now. I have no idea what was in their head at this point in time, but this is a big reason why we won when we really should not have, okay? I just wanted to kind of emphasize that point because I'm not sure how often I'm going to see this kind of con uh, team comp and slash. It happens every once in a blue moon. It doesn't happen very often, but I wanted to talk about it now while I had it because, boy, oh, boy, this was a huge building error on the part of the enemy team, and I just... It's insane to me. But, um... Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to address very specifically here with this um, video. Well, we, we talked quite extensively about my decision-making as a hunter why I make certain decisions, uh, things you should be thinking about as a hunter. Uh, we just kind of, this is kind of the intermediate. This is more, a bit more of getting into the weeds. The next episode is Conquest, where I'm going to get much more into the weeds here of what hunters should be tackling and what they shouldn't be. Um, but, you know, we'll we'll deal with that as it comes. It'll be formatted very similarly to this, because I, I do like the freedom of being able to pause the game and talk about specific points. Which is great. Um, with that being said, uh, thank you all very much for joining me. Uh, if you liked this, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, please ignore me. And if you have any comments, questions, concerns, ideas, suggestions, or requests, please leave them down in the comment section below. And thank you all very much for joining me and have a great 24 hours.